Did you know that the episode you are about to listen to is available on YouTube as a full multi-camera experience? Search for the Murder Police podcast channel on YouTube. Subscribe and see what you have been missing. And in our museum, there was a big, um, one of the walls, there was this, you know, they used to, you've seen them, these panoramic pictures of all the Indians lined up. It's like three cameras and they put it all together. So they've got this big panorama of uh, Osage is probably in the 19, 1920, maybe late 19, uh, 19 teens. And there is a piece missing out of it. He can see that a section is gone out of the panel. And he says, well, this is nice, but what, what was there? And she says, the devil was standing there. Warning. The podcast you're about to listen to may contain graphic descriptions of violent assaults, murder, and adult language. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Murder Police Podcast. Luana Redcorn, Part 2. The Killers of the Flower Moon. So that was one of my motivators. And then the other one is that, you know, there's just some other things that, that I wanted to do. Um, I'm from Oklahoma. Um, that's where I was born. That's where uh, my parents grew up. That's where my heart is. And uh, I'm a citizen of the Osage Nation. That's where our nation is. And I wanted to, to be there. I wanted to be more involved um, in tribal government and affairs and to be more involved with my family, my extended family, who's all still there. So you can't do that when you're working full time as a as a prosecutor, going to crime scenes at night, right. and going to court still and and doing all the other things that are, are required of a uh, Commonwealth attorney. So that, those things went into my decision to to retire. And and I'm still doing a bunch of stuff. I'm just doing a lot of training still for prosecutors. I would hope so. I yeah. am. And uh, I've done spent a year volunteering for our Osage Attorney General, doing some projects for him. That's over now. And I'm teaching, uh, co-teaching a capital punishment class at the University of Kentucky College of Law. So okay. I am uh, as I heard Professor Allison Conley say, I'm not retired, I've refired <laughs> myself uh, and just doing some new things. Mm-hmm. How Good fun. Deal. Well, that's one thing I wanted to talk about, too, is because uh, what we can roll into, you're celebrating your heritage mm-hmm. a lot. It uh, A couple of times on the show, we've talked about on my side, my dad's side of the family, the Irish heritage and uh, to the point where I actually years ago uh, drug Wendy in to do Irish dance with me. I did. Oh boy. And, uh, yeah, exactly. She did good. She uh, she had her own fun. unique girl choreography. It didn't match the rest of the troupe, but it was pretty. Well, you know, I like too. to stand out. It's like a mm-hmm. team of one. Yeah, we just called that. A, yeah, we just called it an improv solo. And so solo. I did my own moves and my own solo. And Wendy says and... we got to get back to it. So I've always I've always been big on that too, and and whatnot. And I think that uh, I. I'd communicate with you a little bit. I travel a lot. Mm-hmm. And whenever I'm out, specifically in Oklahoma, in, yes. in the West, is uh, especially if I have to drive to the gig I'm going to, I, all I can think of is the frontier. And the, and the not just the people that settled it, but the people that were there when it was getting settled. Right. Um, I've spent some time at some of the cultural museums in Oklahoma mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So, um, and on the, the heels of a, a fantastic movie that, just recently came out yes. had tons of, of, of award nominations. Unfortunately, I don't think it brought any It home. didn't get any. No gold man mm. went home with anyone <laughs> related yeah. to that movie. But yeah. Yeah. the Osage um, singers, mm-hmm. the men singers, the women singers um, performed because yeah. Washaji, a song for my people, was nominated for an Oscar. Oh, and wow. uh, the Osage um Many Osage people performed that live at the Oscars, and that was a huge win wow. for us. Big huge time. win. Yeah. And the movie being Killers of the Flower Moon. Yes. And uh, watching that, again, I'm pretty sure I was in Oklahoma when I watched it, is let's, let's start with uh, uh, your recognition of, of your heritage, uh, maybe when, you, when that really grabbed you. I don't know how old you were when that came or what the influences were, what you do now. And then uh, let's let's if you don't mind, because I know you give presentations on it, if we could talk about the uh, the 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 whole thing with the solved and unsolved murders during that time period that the the killers of the flower moon 
compressed in there. Mm-hmm. So okay, well, um, well, thank you for asking because mm-hmm. this is really important stuff to me. Uh, well, in terms of you know my heritage, I mean, this is just what I was born into. So, gotcha. um, you know, that's it's been a part of my life since I was born. Um, even though when I was a child, we moved away from Pahuska, we always returned um, several times a year, and that's where all the family is, and that's where the the nation is. So, you know, we were always a part of the culture. Um, and I've worked really hard. My husband and I worked really hard to make sure that our children are part of the culture. Both of our boys dance during our enlanchka, which is our ceremonial dances. Let me just give you a like the, you know, Reader's Digest version about the Osage Nation, okay? Sure, please. Okay, so we are we are sitting on ancestral lands of the Osage. Um, they were in this land probably before 1300, mm-hmm. um, uh, Kentucky, the Ohio Valley, Mississippi, um, Arkansas, all through that area. And then probably around the 1300s migrated to the Missouri area, which is where they were for a very long time. And that's where first contact came with Europeans. Okay. Um, during uh, the time that um, we were in Missouri, we entered into several, I think, seven treaties with the United States government and um, seceded millions of acres um, to finally end up on a 150, uh, uh, I mean, 1.5 million acres in Oklahoma. Um when we went to Oklahoma, we bought our reservation, which was something that you, if anybody watched the movie or read the book, would realize was an important thing because most reservations were trust lands given to Indian nations to live on. I mean, we all know the stories from history that the government removed many Indians from uh, the southeast, you know, the five civilized tribes to Oklahoma and others. Um but Osage bought their reservation and owned it in fee simple, okay. which was important because when it came time to allot the land, um, it made a, a big difference in how they could deal with the government on that. So we moved from Kansas, our Kansas reservation to Oklahoma. We buy the reservation from the Cherokee. Cherokee are already there because they've been removed. And... um we fight allotment. Now, for people that don't know what allotment is, when the government um, took native land and then put uh, the Indians on reservations, they then divided up the reservations so that each person would own a piece of land. Remember, originally, these reservations were owned communally. Gotcha. Not a piece of land. So the Osage fought allotment. Um, until 2006, right before Oklahoma statehood. And so um, in fighting allotment, they were able to negotiate more land. So in the end, every Osage that was on the Osage allotment roll ended up with about 650 acres of land. But the tribe continued to own the um, what was under the ground. So we basically had an underground reservation. Okay. And that's where all the wealth came from. And that's kind of what the book is based on, is that um, when oil was discovered and when it really hit big, the Osages became very wealthy. And how that worked was they took the 229, 2,229 Osages that were on the allotment roll and gave each of them something called a head right. And that head right entitled them to a part of the mineral estate, the oil and gas estate that was underground, and resulted in quarterly annuity payments to each individual, whether you were a man, woman, or child. Anybody that was alive in 2006, 1906, uh, when the role was created, got a piece. It was just really kind of interesting in a way, because women (laughs) were on the same footing as men. (laughs) I kind of grasped that in the movie. I mean, women are on the same footing of men because the same amount of wealth Mm -hmm. that men had. And so did children, although children had, you know, guardians. Right. Um, So uh, that's kind of the basis of of what that book is about. That book and then later the movie by Martin Scorsese is about the murder of several Osages for their head rights. 
And then you get some idea uh, from the book and the movie about really the overall corruption that was going on because after all the money came, Congress decided that full bloods were incompetent. Okay. So on the Osage allotment roll, the first, I think it's like 871 are full bloods. And then the remaining people on the roll are mixed bloods or it's not clear whether they had any degree of Osage blood in them, but they got on the roll. Gotcha. So uh, full bloods were declared to be incompetent and had to have a guardian and there was probably good guardians, but there were many um, corrupt guardians who took their wards money or directed their wards where to spend their money or charge fees for doing things for their wards and just gave them a pittance. So yeah, imagine that get a little bit of money floating around mm-hmm. and we'd have corruption. It brings yeah. out the best in everybody. It does. It does for sure. It, uh, let's talk about the murders. Yeah. It, to, to the degree that you can on that, because again, um, uh, well, again, I, I guess when you watch the movie, it's a long movie. Mm-hmm. But when you get it, you're, <laughs> it's you're, a long so movie. Yeah, it was yeah. so captivating. Yeah, it. Uh, but when you when you're watching it, you, it's it's compressed and probably a little bit of poetic license into it. It felt like it was prehistorically accurate, or at least they portrayed it that mm-hmm. way. Um, how many of those came back to bad guardians, and then what what else was going on? That right. Well, the let me just step in back. The movie is based on the book. The book is all historical okay. fact. Gotcha. The book is fact. The writer, David Gran, um, came to Osage, gosh, I can't remember, like 2011. He called my Aunt Catherine, who was then the director of the Osage Tribal Museum. He had heard from someone else about this. He'd never, I mean, he didn't know anything about it, but he'd heard about these murders. So she says, well, why don't you just come down to Pahuska? That's where the nation is located, and I can introduce you around and stuff. So he comes down to the museum. And in our museum, there was a big, um, one of the walls, there was this, you know, they used to, you've seen them, these panoramic pictures of all the Indians lined up. It's like three cameras and they put it all together. So they've got this big panorama of uh, Osages probably in the 19, hmm, 1920, maybe late 19, uh, 19 teens. And there was a piece missing out of it. He can see that a section is gone out of the panel and he says, well, this is nice, but what what was there? And she says, the devil was standing there. And he says, w- w- what do you mean? And, sh- and sh- she tells him that, um, then shares with him that this man who murdered all these people and was responsible for the death of a number of people was that in that panel of the picture. And so they she removed it out oh, of wow. the museum. Um, you know, not... The devil. He had no place, no place there. Gotcha. So, he so was, that was what sparked Grand to write the book. He spends, gosh, I don't know, five or six years researching it. It's, it's, I mean, he goes, he dig, digs deep, writes the book, and the book is so compelling. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Martin Scorsese uh, decided to make a movie out of it, and the rest is history for the Osage people. Yeah, well, for everybody. Yeah, because I, I, I just I'll have to get the book now too for yeah. sure, but. Just from the opening part of it, most of that I never knew. Yes. I never knew about the the oil boom, the the influx of it, the economy out there, and the and the, and the wealth, and it never knew that. Yeah. Of course, when we're growing up, we get a different well, history you know, is written by the winners. <laughs> yes, exactly. What a good way to put it. Yeah. What a good way to put it. So back to the the the, the murders. Do do you have information on the particular ones unsolved, unsolved? Oh or, well, you know? you know, you know what brought. One other thing you don't really get so much from the movie, but you really get from the book is the involvement of the Bureau of Investigation, which was the agency that preceded the FBI. Okay. So this, the invest, uh, so for the people start dying, Mm. some suspicious, some appear to be poisoned. Some are just outright murdered. I mean, we're talking, you know, gunshot wounds. There's no question. These, these are homicides. And, you know, local and state officials, whether uh, they're unable or won't, nothing happens. I mean, mm-hmm. nothing happens for several years. And so the in frustration, um, the tribe contacts, you know, through the channels, the uh, federal contacts Washington and asks for someone to come and help us 
down here in the Osage. And that's when the Bureau of Investigation stepped in. By the time the FBI got in there, the case was probably the early murders were years old. Gotcha. So they were going back and, and trying to recreate and look at you've been there looking at cold cases, mm-hmm. other people's work, questions that weren't asked, files that have gone missing. Yep. You know, the things that make it really difficult to to do investigations. Plus, um, we're not, you know, we weren't necessarily dealing with informants, but, you know, um, some people just don't want to talk because people are turning up dead. Yes. That's a pretty good incentive to keep your keep mouth your shut. Mouth yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but the Bureau comes in and eventually uh, three three people were ultimately convicted. Now, you all, um, I think probably about 24, 26 murders bought, brought the Bureau in. At least, you know, 60 or more Osages died mysteriously and maybe even more than that. Because we're talking about um, an an unreasonable percentage of Indians dying compared to the total population. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's a, there are, I know, strong belief that many more people were murdered than cases were ever prosecuted or ever investigated. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is the time of, you know, we didn't have, um, the coroner was whoever volunteered to be the coroner. Maybe it was a physician. This is before any of the modern things that we know today that happen in criminal investigations happen. You know, they pull together a a coroner's inquest and you pulled whoever happened to be standing there and they would be the ones to decide whether this was act of man or act of God. True. Take that and uh, the lack of information highways that we have now. I mean, one of the things right now is that we've, everything is digitally recorded and, and processed out. You got nothing. And uh, we're talking about big stretches of land where people just could disappear. Yes. I mean, just uh, so there we go. And I agree with you that when you start looking at those numbers, just uh, percentage-wise, the probability is not real high that those most of those be natural. And throw in the money. Yeah. There we go. The back to the money thing again, too. So um, what did they – when they convicted those three, did they – what kind of sentences did they get? Right. Well – what I think what helped in the convictions, David, was that several of the murders were all in one family. Okay. So remember, I talked about head rights. That mm-hmm. was that was where you got paid because of the mineral estate. Well, those head rights could be passed on to your heirs. So if you died, your children or your spouse would get your head rights. And so the movie and the book uh, focuses on one particular family, the the family of. Molly Burkhart, uh, Rita Smith, Lizzie Q, and Anna Brown. This is uh, Lizzie Q is the mom, and the other three women are her daughters. And one of her daughters dies mysteriously in her early 20s. Uh, she's married to a man named uh, Bill Smith. Bill Smith then marries her sister. Um, her sister's home, along with Bill Smith, is blows up. Mm-hmm. And then the other daughter, the third sister, a woman named Anna Brown, is shot in the head. All of these head rights are all going to one woman, which is a woman named Molly Burkhart. That's the fourth sister. And so the movie and the book focuses on on Molly and her marriage to a man named Ernest Burkhart. In the end, Ernest is one of the individuals that ends up getting convicted uh, of his involvement in the murder. Um, the other person that ends up getting convicted, and it was probably the mastermind of the whole, of that group of murders, is the devil, the one that was in the panel. Hale, he was the father, or the uncle, excuse me, the uncle of Ernest Burkhart, Mm -hmm. and had a lot of control over his nephew, um, and I'm sure had a role in his nephew marrying Molly. And they portrayed that in and the movie. And they portrayed that in the movie, yeah. And um, so uh, he was instrumental in um, getting uh, a man by the name of John Ramsey to be involved in the other murder for which Hale got convicted, and that was a man named Henry Roan Horse or Henry Roan, who was also an Osage, who was murdered. Um, Hale had bought a life insurance policy on him. Uh, so he would he cho- he would uh, be able to gain 
uh, from his death. And, you know, so the three of them all got convicted. Uh, Ernest pled guilty, eventually admitted his role uh, in the murders and uh, was sentenced to life. The other two, it's an interesting story and um, it's uh, it's interesting to me, at least as a lawyer, because it was a matter of jurisdiction. Originally, they um, they prosecuted um, Hale and Ramsey in federal court because Henry Rohn had been killed on an Osage land. Uh, it was allotted land that had never been sold, and the judge dismissed it, saying there was no jurisdiction. You know, there's certain rules about where you have to have a trial. And they have to have federal jurisdiction. It has to be on federal land or a federal crime. And so the judge dismissed it. So they tried to try him in state court. That never worked out. Um, and then eventually the United States Supreme Court said, oh, no, no, there's federal jurisdiction. So they went to trial. There was a hung jury. Turned out that jurors had been bribed. So no no conviction. <laughs> Go um, figure. Yeah. yeah. They went to trial. It was a um, conviction, but it got reversed. So they went to trial again, and ultimately both Hale and um, Ramsey were convicted. And I think, I can't remember, 99 years, I think, is what they ended up with. In the end, everyone got paroled. Um, Ernest uh, ended up living the rest of his days in Oklahoma. I think Hale died in Arizona or somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, And Molly, who was a... uh, Incompetent because she was a full blood, ultimately became competent and, um, you know, lived out, you know, a few more years and remarried and and had a good life. But, you know, the community was obviously um, permanently and forever impacted by those times because it was way more than just the ones that I've talked about today. I mean, there's hardly any families that were not impacted by murder and if not murder by fraud and fear and and everything else. So it's a um I think the most Osages were were pleased with the book and pleased with the movie for mainly just because the story is told. I mean, right. you know that that this is something that happened and and people should know about it. We'll be back after a quick break. Is it really possible for a tiny tweak to your morning coffee routine to ignite your metabolism and put your body into fat-burning mode for the rest of the day? Yes. Thanks to Java Burn, a proprietary formula that, when combined with coffee, is scientifically proven to increase the speed and efficiency of metabolism to deliver unparalleled fat-burning energy. Java Burn is tasteless and instantly dissolves in your coffee. The result? fat melts off your body. Send your metabolism into overdrive with Java Burn now by clicking the link in the description of this podcast. No, I agree. It's powerful stuff. It, um, what lessons would be for somebody that's in a prosecutorial business, but are there any lessons that taking forward from that that you've found in that? Well, I don't, I don't know. You know, so much has changed since that time. True. Um, you know, I have used David Grant's book to to talk about um, ethics. You know, I mean, if you went back and looked at the the book and and read further about it, you would see that how far we have come as a as a uh, government and legally in terms of making sure that people are are treated fairly, et cetera. There are certainly lessons about how to treat victims. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the movie, because I mean, it's clear that the Indians were con- were considered less than human uh, in the way that they were being treated. So, I mean, it's it's hard for me to draw some real clear lessons um, because so much has changed in the way True. that we investigate and prosecute things. I think the more fundamental lessons are probably just have to be uh, are related to um, knowledge and awareness of our past. I know we're, we're sometimes it's not um, popular to want to know about the wrongs that this country was built on. Yeah. Um, but I think you pointed out yourself that um, with law enforcement, that we want to have the best law enforcement and criminal justice system that we can have. And we do that by correcting mistakes and by widening our points of view 
and by understanding um, the ways of other people. There we go. You know, it's not all it's not all the way that we think it is because everybody's looking at it through a different lens. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, that whole thing of uh, memorializing in the current memory, not so much to commiserate or to, to anything like that, but that, to me, that's how you protect from having what we'd call the predictable surprise. Again. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, that, absolutely. If, if you don't look at that, and then you, you have to share it, you have to distribute it, and it has to be learned from, or, or we, I, I wouldn't say, you know, you could still have somebody slide off the ethical wagon. Sure. And have ridiculous stuff happen we're, somewhere. We're just people. That's we're it. just people. That's it. Yeah, people are, yeah, what it is. And you've got to take the best thing in the world and add people and you'll screw it up, right? It's, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think that's a powerful thing. It, inside the, uh, now present day, you spend a lot of time going out to Oklahoma. Yes. Correct. Mm-hmm. It, it, uh, what's life out there like now? Well, I would invite any of your listeners to come yeah. out. Well, and, we'll be uh, first. And, uh, so. and experience the Osage. Of course, since the book and since the movie, there's a, a lot of interest sure. out there. We also, this is non-Osage and it's not related to murder, but we also have a woman named uh, Reed Drummond, who's the pioneer woman on the Food Network. And okay. so we have many people travel to Pahuska to go to her restaurant there. Okay. <laughs> so, and uh, we just opened a casino. Mm-hmm. In Pahuska. So there is lots of stuff to do uh, in the Osage. Yeah. This is where our nation is. Um, this is where our tribal museum is. We're just reopening our welcome center. We just bought Ted Turner's ranch. It's a kind of a land, take land back program, yeah. you know. So we bought back uh, mm-hmm. his, his ranch a couple years ago. Uh, so the Osage Nation, for uh, people that, you know, just no reason people should understand this, but uh, federal recognized uh, Indian tribes or nations, they're sovereign. Right. I mean, in and of themselves, they have a trust relationship with the federal government that was established at the time that that land was taken. Mm-hmm. And so we have our own government. I mean, we have an elected chief, we have a Congress, we have a criminal justice system, we have a attorney general, um, we have trial judges, we have social services, we have Indian health. Um, and, uh, you know, with things like the Ted Turner ranch and the farm, we're working towards food sovereignty. So it's a, it's an exciting time. Um, and I'm sure the same is happening with many other Indian nations, but it's an exciting time to, um, to be Osage, not just because of the movie, but because finally we have the ability to, um, define our own future. Gotcha. I mean, it wasn't until 2006 that we became actually sovereign, that there wasn't the government telling us who we were. We got to elect and vote for ourselves who we are. Yeah, I think I've told you when I travel, too, it's, I've always been fascinated when I meet tribal police officers because of the nuances of how that. that it's a very nation. complicated. It, super, super. Yeah, they can't even. I, I, I try to pick their brains for hours and I can't walk away with a, a clear understanding. But. Um, that that whole part of what that's like to work and the rules of engagement and disengagement and things like right, that. Right, whether so. you're dealing with native, non-natives, right. um, yeah. where it happens, mm-hmm. jurisdictional issues, it's it's complicated. But it's but it's okay because we've this is what we've created and we need to do it as best we can. I think it works. I would never every I've never met anybody that said it's not working. Right. It's not there. Now, one thing I do see there's a there's a lot of social media uh, advocacy out there. Uh, on American Indians, period, mm-hmm. is uh, there's a lot of talk, and I don't know if you can speak to it or not, about uh, domestic violence on indigenous women or missing indigenous mm-hmm. women. Do, mm-hmm. do you have any data on that? Or I, any, I any, do not. Yeah. Um, I don't. Mm-hmm. Um, fortunately, it hasn't been a huge issue for Osage. Okay. Um, and, I mean, this is just me kind of anecdotally uh, saying this, but, you know, some of these... Indian reservations are huge. I mean, like, so it's a very spaced out and mm-hmm. not a lot of people, right. not a lot of um, resource. We're, we're Osage are pretty fortunate. We have some good resource, not, mm-hmm. not so much from the oil, but we, you know, from the uh, gaming. And so I think that a lot of that is in areas where there is lack of resource, lack of law enforcement. Probably. Um, but yes, Women, um, domestic Native women, are um, disproportionately uh, victims of domestic violence as rela- as to other uh, non-Native women. Well, Luana, thank you so much for coming and sharing with us about 
being a Commonwealth attorney and your Osage Nation. It was so interesting to to have watched the movie and then to have, well, to have somebody sitting right here with us. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. And thank you for watching the movie. It um, was really good. I do encourage our listeners, if you haven't seen Killers of the Flower Moon, it is long, like David said, but it was so worth it. I I was I didn't get up. Usually I get up a few times in a movie. I didn't get up not one time. It was very captivating. Well, it's a story worth watching, and uh, and it's a story that you should watch. I, yeah, absolutely. And again, thanks for coming, too. It's like a reunion from, from back in the day, too, and and for sharing that, that uh, personal perspective on that piece of history that, uh, again, we don't always get told. And for so. your work as Commonwealth Attorney. Thank you all absolutely. both very much. The Murder Police Podcast is hosted by Wendy and David Lyons and was created to honor the lives of crime victims, so their names are never forgotten. It is produced, recorded, and edited by David Lyons. The Murder Police Podcast can be found on your favorite Apple or Android podcast platform, as well as at MurderPolicePodcast.com, where you will find show notes, transcripts, information about our presenters, and a link to the official Murder Police Podcast merch store, where you can purchase a huge variety of Murder Police podcast swag. We are also on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, which is closed captioned for those that are hearing impaired. Just search for the Murder Police podcast and you will find us. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe for more and give us five stars and a written review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcasts. Make sure you set your player to automatically download new episodes so you get the new ones as soon as they drop. And please tell your friends. Lock it down, Judy.